Get out your Mordren Canaan's Tome of Foes, because it's time to learn about the Deathlock. Okay, you guys, if you're following along in Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, the Deathlock is an incredibly, incredibly narrative, excellent choice for using undead in your spooky adventures. Now, I want to start off by saying that if you have adventures or a campaign where some one or multiple people are playing warlocks, this is a superb monster to use because you can use the death lock as a foreshadowing mechanism for so many different angles within stories and campaigns. The idea of the death lock is that you have a warlock who failed to fulfill their pact and has been punished with an undead existence serving their patron. Um, so off the top of my head, I read this and I was like, ooh, what an awesome in-game punishment for a warlock who fails to roleplay and act according to their pact. And I'm going to tell you this. This might come off as a little bit harsh, but I'm going to tell you this. When I think of warlocks, I think that a DM is well within their right to kind of keep track of how consistently a player is playing a character who is a warlock. Warlock and how consistently they are demonstrating their their servitude to their patron Because if they're not If a player is just using a warlock no matter what pact they have If they're just using a warlock as like another kind of spellcaster and they're not really integrating the role playing of that pact into the game You need to give them reminders of why that's important take away some of their powers punish them in some ways and if they're consistently failing to fulfill their pact kill them and bring them back as a death lock. That's kind of one end of the extreme pendulum of how you can use death locks. Another end would be you have an NPC who's an ally of the party. And that could be a friend of somebody who is already a warlock in the party, or it could be somebody who's like an arcane caster or even a divine caster who has made an alliance with a warlock. You know, And maybe this warlock NPC has gone on adventures with the party. And you know when they were lower level and then as a recurring NPC in your campaign and then something happens They haven't heard from him in a while. They haven't seen him in a while They start you know asking around about him and they find out that like he's disappeared and that the last known place He went was this you know the tower of uh, blah 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 and you know they start to investigate they find out that in fact he had failed or broken his pact and was punished and came back as a death lock this could create a whole scenario, multiple adventures, where they're trying to basically at first find out what's going on with this friend. Or, you know, it doesn't even have to be an ally or a friend. It could be an NPC that you set up as someone of interest to the party. And maybe the family of that person is like, find him and redeem him. It's not too late to save him. You know, so they could be heroes in this mix. The idea that they could try to find this deathlock and somehow figure out a way to bring him back to redeem him in some way. Or if they determine that that's not possible, then they have to stop him. But they find out that he's part of a much larger conspiracy, that there are other death locks, other failed warlocks bound to this patron. And this could weave itself into a, an entire campaign. I'm so excited because this is such a great and yet subtle and already broken up and scaled um, option. So. Let's start off by looking at the three types that are explored here. So there's the base Deathlock, there's the um, Deathlock White, and then there's the Deathlock Mastermind. And actually, if you wanted to look at them in terms of power, you kind of start off on the low end with a Deathlock White, and then a regular Deathlock, and then a Deathlock Mastermind. So what is a Deathlock? Well, other than what I kind of already explained, it's basically a warlock who failed or broke their pact and was punished with an undead servitor kind of existence. Um, this means that basically anything that doesn't have to do with fulfilling their pact is no longer important. They might retain some memories of their previous existence, which 
leads to kind of cool story playing and interactive elements, but they no longer have desires to do anything other than fulfill the, um, the, the will of their patron, of their master. So at the um, death lock level, a regular death lock is considered challenge rating four. Uh, with an AC of 12 or 15 if they happen to cast Mage Armor, 8d8 hit points. Um, they have damage resistance to necrotic, and then bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks that aren't silvered. Damage immunities to poison. They're immune to exhaustion and poison. Uh, they have innate spellcasting. So the Deathlock's innate spellcasting ability is charisma, just like a warlock. DC 13, it can innately cast the following spells requiring no magical components. At will, detect magic, disguise self, and mage armor. Do you realize how powerful disguise self is at will, that they could just do that? So they don't have to walk around looking like a, a undead skeleton zombie kind of version of their, themselves. They could appear to be how they looked. They could appear to look like anyone, frankly. You could have so much fun with that as a DM. Maybe they don't even know, maybe the party doesn't even realize that their friend is a Deathlock. Maybe this Deathlock is clever and has like infiltrated the party, which would make sense by the way, because the um, suggested intelligence they give is a 14. So it's not like you're dealing with a dumb zombie who's just like, eh, kill, the master has told me to kill. You know, This could be a very clever uh, kind of infiltration of the party. And, and if you establish this NPC as like a friend and an ally, and maybe even good prior to their pact being broken and being turned into a deathlock, maybe there are machinations from higher level deathlocks, like a deathlock mastermind, or even from the patron themselves or itself, um, to have this deathlock infiltrate the party to find out information or to acquire something or to manipulate the party to acquire some things and go on adventures to acquire things all with this subliminal notion that they're doing this for their master, for their patron. So awesome, so awesome. Deathlocks have so much story potential. Innate spellcasting just with those three things is pretty badass. But then you have um, their ability to cast as a fifth level spellcaster. Again, using charisma as their ability, spell save DC, plus five to hit with spell attacks. Uh, it regains its expended spell slots when it finishes a short or long rest, just like a warlock. It knows the following warlock spells. Chill Touch, Eldritch Blast, and Mage Hand um, as cantrips at will. And then first through third level spells, they have two third level spell slots. Arms of Hadar, Dispel Magic, Hold Person, Hunger of Hadar, Invisibility, and Spider Climb. They have Turn Resistance. The Deathlock has advantage on saving throws against any effect that turns on dead which makes them significantly more formidable when it comes to um, having divine people in the party trying to you know, uh, cast them away with turn on dead. They also have a melee attack, Deathly Claw, which is plus four to hit. Uh, it does 2d6 plus two necrotic damage. I mean, frankly, with their spells that they're able to cast at will, I don't even know why they would bother with that, but it's cool. Now, they have patron-specific spells as an option for the DM to choose when they're building a deathlock. Let me explore that. So you can customize a deathlock by replacing some or all of its spells in its spellcasting trait with spells specific to its patrons. Here are examples. So if they had an Archfey patron, you could swap out your spells with things like Blink, Fairy Fire, Hunger of Hadar, Hypnotic Pattern, Phantasmal Force, or Sleep. And then they go through all these options, including the Fiend, the Great Old One. That's pretty amazing. It's a challenge rating four thing. So it's something that, again, if you introduce this character, this NPC, when they are mortal as a warlock, um, and maybe have them be a recurring NPC in like the early levels, like first, second, third, fourth, or whatever, you can work your way up to this storyline where this NPC has become a deathlock. And now at mid-level, this is a perfect match to kind of infiltrate the party or to go directly opposed to them or compete with them, however you want to play that. But it's a great way to do this. Now, um, the Deathlock Mastermind is a bit more powerful. It's already scaled up. So you don't even have to use my scaling system because they have uh, a version of the Deathlock that's scaled up a little bit higher. 
The Mastermind has AC 13 or 16 with Mage Armor. They have significantly more hit points, 20 D8 plus 20 hit points. Um, pretty much the same damage resistances, immunities, condition immunities, and so on. They're considered a challenge rating eight, so let's find out why. Well, I'm sure you can guess. It has to do with their spellcasting abilities. So they're more powerful warlocks um, who were able to retain more of their knowledge and magic after they were turned, and they're basically like captains, you know, in the hierarchy, more directly in contact with their patron, and kind of even having underlings too. So that's another component. The Deathlock Mastermind might have other undead who serve it in order to fulfill the will of the patron. Um, the innate spell casting is uh, at a slightly higher, not significantly, but you know, DC uh, 14 for spell saves against their magic. They also have Detect Magic, Disguise Self, and Mage Armor. Their spell casting is done at as a 10th level spellcaster. Um, slightly better, like I said, DC 14 spell save against their magic, plus six to hit with spell attacks. They have the same cantrips uh, with the exception of adding in Poison Spray and Minor Illusion instead of Disguise Self. So there's that. Uh, they have 1st through 5th level spells with two 5th level spell slots. Um, Arms of Hate are Blight, Counterspell, Crown of Madness, Darkness, Dimension Door, Dispel Magic, Fly, Hold Monster, and Invisibility. They also have advantage on saving throws against any effect that turns undead. They have Deathly Claw as well, it's a little bit more powerful, plus 6 to hit with 3d6 plus 3 necrotic damage. But then they have Grave Bolts. Check this out. Range spell attack, plus 6 to hit, range of 120 feet. One or two targets. Uh, it's 4d8 necrotic damage. If the target is larger or smaller, it must succeed in a DC 16 strength save or become restrained as shadowy tendrils wrap around it for one minute. A restrained target can use its action to repeat the saving throw, ending the effect on itself on a success. Wow, that's dope. That's so cool. So it's like Eldritch Blast mixed with Thorn Whip. I, it, that's really cool. That's really cool. I could see you developing this whole shadow conspiracy of um, Deathlocks who you have like maybe one or two masterminds that are kind of controlling other Deathlocks within a region, all of whom have other undead who are weaker but are servants, right? So their, their machinations should be tied to some big conspiracy involving the patron. This is all things that you could think out and kind of outline in advance and then create little tiny tendrils of storylines to hook your players into this and have them discover this mystery, this grand conspiracy gradually, piece by piece, puzzle piece by puzzle piece as they go on. It's not something that you would just, bleh, there's a conspiracy. You know, it, it would be something that would be revealed through multiple adventures. And it has, this has such rich potential um, for how you can use this. The Deathlock White is the weakest of the three options. And the reason why is because bereft of much of its magic, a Deathlock, a Deathlock White lingers between the Warlock it was and the deathly existence of a White, a special punishment meted out by certain patrons and necromancers. So they're weaker. Um, because of the fact that they don't have um, the same level of spell casting, but it's also an actual like story element. Like they were punished extra hardcore and, and you know, given um, less of their old abilities, which is pretty cool. Um, they have pretty much all the same resistances, yada yada, fewer hit points. Uh, they do have innate spell casting, um, DC 13 for their save. They have Detect Magic, Disguise Self, and Mage Armor. They have one um, spell per day, Fear, Hold Person, or Misty Step. Where they are a little more susceptible is Sunlight Sensitivity. So while in Sunlight, the white has disadvantage on attack rolls as well as Wisdom or Perception checks that rely on Sight. That makes sense. All right, so their attacks, however, are still really cool. They attack twice with Grave Bolt. Still a ranged spell attack, plus five to hit, 120 feet range, and 1d8 plus three necrotic damage. So 
certainly not as much damage inducing as the grave, grave bolts that come from a Deathlock Mastermind, but still pretty badass at low level. That, that could do a lot of damage. But they also have Life Drain, and we've seen this effect in use with other undead. Um, life Drain is pretty serious. Uh, plus four to hit, it's a reach attack, five feet range, 2d6 plus two necrotic damage, and the target must succeed on a DC 13 con save, or its hit point maximum is reduced by an amount equal to the damage taken. This reduction lasts until the target finishes a long rest. The target dies if this effect reduces its hit point maximum to zero. A humanoid slain by this attack rises 24 hours later as a zombie under the white's control, unless the humanoid is restored to life or its body is destroyed. The white can have no more than 12 zombies under its control at one time. So this, again, factors into the great conspiracy. Maybe as your campaign goes on and the party finds out more and more about the patron and the kind of cult um, that is following this patron that includes Deathlock servants, masterminds and regular Deathlocks and Deathlock whites, they begin amassing an undead army. So think of it, for every Deathlock white, they could have up to 12 zombies. If you had 10 Deathlock whites who each had a squad of 12 zombies, now you have an army of 120 zombies. And that would be fairly easy to do if they moved around a lot and just kept you know, attacking small hamlets, wiping out the people there, turning them into zombies, bringing them around. It, it's very, in a lot of ways, it has a little bit of a, the, the Game of Thrones overtone with the Night King. Um, you know, you create this undead army and what you can do as that army grows becomes more and more significant, right? You still have to think as a DM though. You have to know, you as the DM, have to know your outline, your master plan. What is the conspiracy? Identify the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Think about the patron. What does the patron want? Think about who serves the patron. It's a mixture of mortal people and cultists and warlocks and necromancers and deathlocks and other undead. And why? Why are they serving this master? Why are they serving this patron? How are they trying to bring this patron through to the prime material plane? So all those questions need to be figured out by you when you're art, you know, creating this arc. But I, I personally feel like the deathlock is has like opened up my eyes to so many potential adventure ideas. And you could drop these guys in. You don't have to create a massive Bill Undead conspiracy campaign involving otherworldly patrons. You could just drop these in, you know, into a mid-level or higher level campaign setting without all of that background, okay? You could, but I don't think it would be the same. I don't think it would have the same impact. And my example is even just to look at other undead. You know, look at how uh, one vampire, Strahd, created a whole setting, okay? What started off Ravenloft, what started off as like one adventure basically became a series which became an entire setting within Barovia, right? And all it took was that one character and then building a story around that. You could do very much the same thing and integrate multiple characters and cults and factions and groups and have them competing for things, some of them knowing what the big plan is, some not even knowing. Think about it. A, a good conspiracy, there's a lot of people involved who don't even know that they're serving the interests of that group or that conspiracy. You could have so much fun with this. So I hope that you give it a chance. And if you have, by the way, if you're a DM or a player who has had experience with Deathlocks, please comment below this video and share your stories. I love to read how other people are using these things. So I hope your October is going well and this has been another Spooky Monster Monday with our undead friends, the Deathlocks. We'll see you on the next one.
Hello, it's me, Wizzy. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. And then don't forget to tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and crafting videos and DM tips and pro tips for vlogging and all sorts of gaming things. And also you could watch Bill eat food and watch other shows featuring Bill. He made me say that because he's a narcissist. Okay, bye.